Uh, good afternoon. Hopefully, uh, I've got a good bite to eat and uh, uh, we'll keep you from napping uh, through through this uh, through the, the post launch uh, uh, coma. Um, my name is John Eskenshee. I work for uh, Alert Logic and the manager of the Threat Intelligence Group. And uh, my partner here on stage, Chris Compton. Hi. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm Chris Compton. I'm the, uh, the principal researcher on John's intelligence team. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is kind of lessons we've learned from both intelligence and uh, incident response, kind of detection, how to do it, and how not to do it. So, that. Just a tiny bit about myself. Um, I've, I've been working for Logic for, uh, and, and its acquired company for uh, a year-ish prior to that. I uh, worked in the threat intelligence and cyber various groups that had the word cyber and defense in the, in the names at Microsoft for uh, a few years, uh, consulting background, semantic at stake, at and and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, over the course of that, um, I've had an opportunity, especially in consulting roles, had a great opportunity to see a wide variety of organizations and the types of Attacks uh, that that uh, sort of were endemic, and how that was uh, how that changed per industry, and a lot you'll see a lot of that information is what led us to uh, to, to work uh, on this. And when I came to Microsoft, working with this guy, uh, yeah. So we uh, no, a little, little, little background. Okay, little like, background on yourself. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, so I uh, I was with the Mitre Corporation, uh, doing research in the information security world for a long time. After that, uh, actually went to uh, I actually went to Microsoft, where I focused on counterintelligence. I uh, founded a team called the Network Security Asset and Threat Analysis Team, which was an awfully long name. Uh, that's where I worked with John, uh, where we were focused on, I believe the term was high value assets and determined human adversaries. Uh, is, we're not going to say APT. Every time we say APT, you have to give Kevin Mandy a nickel. So, uh, <laughs> determined human adversaries. Um, we worked on that for a while. Uh, I actually then had the good fortune to go over and work on anti-fraud with Xbox. Uh, so I was on the anti-fraud controls for your Xbox One. Unless you have a PS4, in which case, man. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, I joined Alert Logic. Oh, and then I went to AWS. So I did AWS security up until about three or four months ago. And uh, now I'm working again with John. So. All fun stuff. So a little bit of shared history, and we thought it would be a, a good topic to share kind of the, the, the variety of different experiences we've had that converged on some uh, uh, good methods for uh, smoothing out uh, detection coverage, how to actually see complete attacks, how to not overspend money on, on uh, controls that are already functioning and so on. So we figured that, you know, that basically this also uh, falls out into a discussion on uh, blind spots on figuring out what it is that you can't see um, by looking at at uh, uh, sort of typical attack patterns and uh, being a little bit structured in that thinking. So um, today's short agenda, basically uh, an example of why not to remediate in some cases. We're talking generally about more interesting events, more things that are not really well characterized. If, if we're talking about simple malware events, um, things that are very well characterized, stuff that almost falls into an IT hygiene sort of uh, uh, category. We're not talking about that. We're talking about things that are a little interesting, something that causes an analyst to do a, have to have the floaty eyebrow effect. Um, and uh, we'll talk a bit about what adversaries do when, when you find something interesting like that. Um, we'll talk about the uh, detection patterns and uh, you know a couple of methods. This is one way that we found pretty effective for driving out where your detection blind spots are, which basically is a foundational piece for response remediation and the rest of the cycle. So. Oh my god! You should freak out immediately! Uh, which incidentally is a, if that's your business model here, I apologize. I don't mean to, <laughs> to speak ill of you. Uh, it's, the instinct, especially when you spend a lot of time talking about kind of small and medium business here, Especially in kind of the medium sized business, you have enough uh, money invested that you know a little about security. You know you care, you know you have regulatory obligations to care. Uh, but you're also a little bit concerned. You, know, you don't want to be in the press, you don't want to have things go horribly wrong. You think, oh my gosh, something's gone wrong. Let's just make it go away as quickly as possible. Like, we'll patch it, we'll fix it, it'll be done, it's good. 
which is awesome if that's what happens, but probably not. Like, you have a serious problem. Uh, if you, people are already on your network, people are already behaving in a bad way. Closing the door at that point is a little bit late, you know? Uh, they're already there, I guarantee you. They've already got persistent access. Uh, so, like, oh, well, we patched the way they got in, or you know, we, we updated the way, so now we'll see them get in next time. Like, it's, you know, you're already shot, man. It's too late to put a bulletproof vest on. Like, do something else. You're in a different <laughs> stage of the life cycle. So instead, what we want to focus on is, okay, if we're going to, is the question like, oh, we'll fix it, we'll patch it, we'll figure out the exploit. Figure out where you are in the life cycle. Figure out what you need to know. Your first question is probably, where am I? What's going on? Like, I'm probably already breached because I have reason to be concerned. Uh, yeah, I should figure out how I got breached. That's interesting. But also, I want to make sure that as I try to shore up how I got breached, I don't lose what happened after I got breached. The days of bad guys breaching just to breach are pretty much over, right? Like nobody just does this for fun anymore. It's a job. So if somebody's breaching you, they're doing it because they want to make money off of you or steal something of value, something of interest. Uh, so if what you do is you run roughshod over the bit to figure out what they did after they got in in the rush to close the door, you're going to miss a lot of things. And then you're going to be behind the curve when you try to figure out what's the actual damage, what's the impact of my customers, what's my legal liability. Because you've already run over them. You've lost all your indicators. And here's the other exciting thing. Odds are pretty good if they're already in your network, they're going to find other holes, other problems, other doors. So when you go slamming that one door shut, uh, almost immediately what you'll do is you'll tell them, ah, well, you know, they know I'm here, they found me, now I have to get a little bit stealth here and use some of the other doors already got set up. They will adapt. Uh, I mean, the important thing to remember, again, when we're dealing with like, actual grown up adversaries, they do this for a living, right? Like if you're in your job one day, and something goes wrong, you don't go, well, crap, I quit. You, know, you think, okay, well, how do I get around that? What do I have to do? Maybe you have a bad day at work, but job's not over, right? Same thing. In order to get a handle on this, I think before we, before we proceed with the rest of, the, of, of this discussion, it's good to take a moment <coughs> to think about, great, we need to be able to describe our adversaries uh, particularly persistent ones, folks that have tooling, folks that maybe you know you're having an attack. You know, some somewhere in the remediation discussions for 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 a, uh, what looks like a, a persistent uh, attacker, you kind of realize that this attack was probably on a Gantt chart on a wall a couple months ago with some guys discussing fallback. And you're like, oh, this is really somebody else's project, and you just happen to be on the wrong end of it. How do you describe that? And before we can get into this kind of answering um, the question of, of you know, how do we protect against, uh, or how do we respond to uh, a persistent attack, we have to have some language that's, that's you know, reasonable. One of the things that's been sort of pervasive, and I think people are starting to pick apart now, is the kill chain approach that's characterized on the top, which, not, not terrible. It's very malware centric. There, there are, uh, it lacks certain uh, ways of describing uh, operations, uh, repetitive attacks, persistence, and pieces. But if you're being, you know, if you have an, a, 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 an adversary that's basically flinging, uh, uh, um, you know, pieces of malware at you through a phishing, uh, a persistent phishing attack, it might be sufficient. If you have, uh, if you're a higher profile target and you've got uh, either an industrial uh, uh, adversary or you've attracted the attention of, of uh, you know, some, some uh, groups that perhaps have, have sort of national sponsorship, um, you're probably going to need a larger language to describe a little bit of the, the, the attack processes, persistence, how it's. Before we can get into um, uh, you know, figuring out blind spots and what the, what they do that you can't see, you have to be able to express it. So uh, you know, it's just it's worthwhile to look at uh, you know a couple of different ways of describing um, whole attacks. Looking at uh, uh, you know how do we how do we uh, uh, express these things so so that we eventually have some categories for our detection controls, and then we can figure out where where they're not so good. Um, at the bottom here. Uh, this is this is sort of a, 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 a bit of a, a you know, piece to go off for another discussion. But you also need to be able to talk to the business risk, the enterprise risk folks when they come when when the non technical folks have actually hold on to uh, budget for remediation for controls for for all that, and they say, well, how bad is it? What's the problem here? 
why are we, you know, being able to speak in a, an enterprise risk language to be able to map back from, um, you know, somebody has uh, free reign for lateral movement through your environment and they've got a foothold, being able to translate that back to, um, you know, a, a risk metric or a, a CMM metric where you think you're at a, at a, at a four or five and really you're, you have an adversary that's shutting you back into a chaotic state. They understand that kind of language so that you can handle this both at a, at a technical level and a business level. So, so it's worth I'm uh, interested in if you're tracking an attack. And let's say you take, uh, let's take the middle, the, t the 10 stage advanced adversary kill chain. Uh, you can put that on a chart, you can map that against time. Right? Like how long do they spend in each stage? How much time do they spend doing recon? How much time do they spend getting you know, entry and lateral movement? And you start getting these kind of interesting curves uh, based on you know, where an attacker spends time. So let's take a look at a sophisticated attacker doing that. This is a uh, organized criminal group. Um, it is not a nation state, but it's a group that had their stuff together coming out of this Russia. Russia. So this is graphic soft tech. This is essentially a ransomware uh, attack. It's pretty standard. This same attack looks about the same now, and you know, same same attack or something like that. Uh, it is also worth noting the dates. Um, it's 2003. So you know, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out new advanced attacks, and figuring out advanced <coughs> attacks is great, but they're probably not brand spanking new. You know, this still works. Nothing's changed here. But if we look at like total time, we we'll look at the timeline here. A whole bunch of time in recon, um, kind of the initial commencement of the attack. They spend a lot of time figuring out what they're going to do. They don't come in and start banging around, making noise, tripping stuff. It's also worth noting, like a lot of detections out there are kind of the IDS model, you know, when we're being under attack. And really that comes down to like entry and foothold phase, which if you look at the time slice is just about the narrowest phase of this graph. So then you're into a really, you know, you're hoping you're looking at the right dog in the right direction at the right time. You know, that's a detection that you've got. It's a detection we all have. We want to make sure we've got that little window. And that's cool. Like, you do absolutely need to have that window. We're going to talk about how you would expand, maybe see the rest of the graph, all of the other things they do after they break in. Again, long time figuring it out. And by the way, I have not ever found a lot of luck looking for attackers in the reconnaissance phase. There's just too much noise. It's pretty tough to tell what you're being. On the other hand, once they're in, you'll notice that they spend quite a few days bouncing around and screwing around finding other stuff. There's all sorts of interesting stuff. So if you know, that's a squared away attacker, a less squared away attacker. Well, one, one of the points, uh, to, just, to, just to add a little bit of color to the, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, the ransom, the, this, is a, this is a 2003 ransom attack, and we talk about ransomware now. Um, since, since you brought it up, we, we actually had in a different uh, set of graphs a comparison between this attack against graphic soft tech, um, which effectively this is one of, one of the earliest cloud, cloud providers. This, this is an infrastructure um, that looks a lot like what Azure and AWS does today. This was a very early version of this, uh, happened to be the largest uh, um, platform for gambling. Uh, in, in the world at the time, plus all of KPMG's uh, extranet infrastructure and uh, IBM GS and a lot of other things. Um, when we translate this into a modern attack, the SamSam style attack, um, pretty much the top of the graph smooths out a little bit. Very recognizable. The operations are the same. The tools are totally different, but what they're doing is the same. This being able to characterize this attack uh, in, in this fashion, using it using a, a sort of dependency model with buckets, kind of built similar to kill chain. This allows us to recognize operational similarities, not just technical ones. So we're able to tell what what kind of an attack, what what does this look like in in, in the past, even if we have an adversary that's, that's swapping tools and updating and so on. Um, so there's there's actually a point I want to make on that one. Important. So a lot of the research that went into this. And we looked at lots and lots and lots of attacks uh, of all sorts of nation state, petty criminal, organized non nation state criminal. Uh, and, and one of the things we found was we tracked technical sophistication of attack and operational sophistication of attack separately. Technical sophistication, you know, how bad is this? Was this just, you know, another RPC become exploit? Was this like some crazy area we've never heard of? 
operational sophistication? Was it just a one and done, or were there lots of complex steps strung together? We found that there is zero, zero correlation between technical sophistication and damage of intent. Doesn't matter. Super badass, super simple, no correlation. There is a one to one correlation between operational sophistication and damage of intent. If you can string together a bunch of complex events, you're dangerous. If you've got incredibly elite malware, you might be dangerous. So uh, I mean, the important lesson is be afraid of your program managers. They're much more dangerous than programmers. Yeah. Um, contrasting this, so contrasting this with uh, a less well-structured attack, um, the TJX attacks, uh, Heart, Heartland, um, Dayton Busters, a bunch of other attacks were all perpetrated by the same crew. Most of their attacks look like this. This is this is uh, by contrast of what a mostly manually operated attack run by folks who didn't do good recon. That's kind of what this looks like. Um, you know, in this case, the, uh, uh, the this crew managed to get into a single business branch location, get into the network, fumble around for a while, get a foothold on on privileged systems. Eventually get to a corporate backbone network, um, get back and, and started building a fairly clunky but custom bespoke uh, uh, sniffer looking for 16 digit numbers off the wire, trying to, trying to gain credit card data. And it didn't work, and then they got it to work, and then it filled up and crashed, and then, uh, you know, the, then they, they, they uh, you know, did various things. It, it bumbled around for a couple of months before they actually got this thing working. And, and the point here, again, I mean, you can read up on the individual attacks, and the point being, uh, uh, ask me about baseball card stuff, stuff later. But the point here is to be able to contrast these, these kinds of attacks. And if you see a lot of this hitting your environment versus a lot of this hitting your environment, that gives you a better sense that maybe if this is what's hitting your environment, you have a better visibility, you have a better chance of seeing this. Um, either you have to be really good at recon, or you have to find these places where you have a little bit better visibility or a bigger time slice or some combination of the two. Because if you have weak visibility and a very short time slice, you can't see. You can't see what's going on. You can either beef those up, or by contrast, you can look at something like this and say, boy, these guys were tremendously noisy. And their sort of lateral movement bouncing around between machines. They were only not caught in this situation out of pretty much the sheer incompetence of the operators, of the, of the folks. They didn't do what they weren't doing monitoring. It's a really <coughs> environment. There's a lot of pressure in those environments um, simply to not spend money to watch anything inside. They're watching their outside network. Nobody thought to look inside. So, so what happens when we can describe the kinds of attacks that we have and we can then figure out what, what's likely to hit us? Oh, look. Here is that David Buster's attack. Here, where's, where are the, these are the typical kinds of things. This is this is a nice little characterization of. Um, does it change colors on here? Yes. Um, we can find distinctive parts of attacks. If I see a whole lot of attacks that look like this, they're hitting my organization. Pull out the distinctive pieces and say, I need to look for this stuff. I had better have my stuff together for these categories of sort of this this post compromise foothold behavior where you see something right after a machine's been compromised and someone is, is sort of ensconcing themselves on, on parallel systems or they're starting to do lateral movement. If, the, if you see a lot of these attacks, then that's maybe where you should spend your, your budget. Um, uh, it's, it's terribly frustrating and I know that a lot of folks in this room will look at, uh, you know, at, at, get hit with a ransomware attack and somebody says, we need to spend a bunch more money on, on, on AV. Well, maybe the AV, you already have pretty good, you just need to update it. Don't, it's not really, uh, um, you know, that you're lacking budget or lacking the tools. You need some minor tweaks, but you were entirely blind to seeing it operating or spreading through the organization. The point here would be you can take this sort of information um, where you can see the typical attack and take that and work out, hey, um, actually, I have a set of tools, and this is just a, I, I threw in a, a, a random mix of things you might be able to see, and just map it out. Just go through an exercise of, hey, actually, I'm pretty good on seeing uh, you know, initial compromise on a host. 
maybe I'm really weak at seeing immediate post-compromise things. I don't see what happens when I get you know, hit with uh, something because the AV was not updated and immediately there's, there's, there's uh, tools being brought down and someone is, is starting to move around in the uh, middle area or maybe I'm really weak on being able to see concealment or maintenance, maintenance activities for, for uh, an adversary that wants to, sit, to, to, to kind of sit around on the network and maintain control. Um, with this sort of, of uh, uh, mapping, I've got some idea of what tools I have. I have some idea of what kinds of attacks I have. And if I can think about it in a structured way, then I can go back and do an inventory and say, I actually, um, you know, the numbers on the left are the typical, sort of the top attacks I see in each category. So I've got maybe only four or five different kinds of recon that are typical of what I'm seeing out of my environment. I need to be able to detect those, or maybe I see maybe I see about six, and I've only got controls that actually see about four. I have a bit of a gap there. Everyone does. Um, the uh, uh, in the middle in the mid range here, lateral movement. I can see most things, but not all. By contrast, entry and foothold, initial compromise on a box, foothold activity, somebody bringing tools through on a network. In this case, I've got a huge investment. I already have a lot of money spent on this. I have tools, I have infrastructure to maintain this. Maybe I need to have a look and tweak those, but focus, you know, focus on the areas where you have a gap between the patterns of attacks you see and the detection capabilities of the tools you have. It's kind of common sense. Everyone go, of course, look for things, you know, if, you, if you're getting hit by things you, you can't see, then you should know it. But there's sometimes a surprising <coughs> lack of consistent methods to do this, to be able to engage in that kind of structured thinking. So that's uh, 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 you know, one way that we've, we've had um, some pretty good luck with, uh, with you know, working through that sort of a structured problem. Well, and also this gives you kind of good language when you're speaking with the people who control the budget and have these security people, or who are making decisions you know, kind of out of that initial panic for you. Oh my gosh, well we've, we've spent a lot on you know, monitoring what you would now say is entry and foothold. And we got hit. Uh, we should spend more there. Maybe, but maybe you should actually think about what else you have. What other tools are available? You know, where else can you route out your capabilities? You know, it's that versatility as opposed to just kind of doubling down on your current method. So, doing this, less panic. Again, kind of speaking to this, maybe you got hit uh, uh, with some, with a, uh, an attack and it was successful at some point in in that uh, sort of the, that, that graphical curve. Um, you had a control failure and uh, and they were able to get farther than than they really should. Um, but that may or may not be the best place to throw more money or effort at defensive or detective controls. I mean, you want to have fairly even detection capability, not just to panic and, and throw capability at the last thing that happened to you. Um, some understanding of threat history, what's happened to you, being able to describe attacks in a reasonable way other than you know saying, hey, we, we had this event six months ago, a year ago, <coughs> two years ago. It was real bad. Can't do anything with that. Um, we, we, you, know, you need to be able to break it down into what part of it was an opera you know, Did you miss some essential piece that you thought you had under control? Um, uh, and, and you need to do something about that. Having an inventory of the controls, what they, what they actually see. Going through that exercise is pretty essential. Patience, a little bit of patience. This is, this is an area in which folks are forced to react really, really fast to, to bad things. And in a lot of cases, especially for the really bad ones, if you're on the wrong end of, a, of, a, of an adversary who is attempting to manipulate behavior, they're going to they're going to keep hitting you on something that's distracting, and maybe you know you're you're missing that. Uh, you, you're, they're they're effectively causing you to deprioritize. You're looking for maintenance, concealment. If you're spending all your time um, updating, chasing malware that isn't actually doing anything, and you're you know you don't have enough time to see that there's your logs are being modified. That's not really what they're doing. You know, uh, you won't find it unless you do some sort of structure, structure analysis. And I will say, I mean, we're talking a lot about attackers, but at the risk of stating the obvious, know what's important to you, 
like know if this stuff gets stolen, we're really screwed. Know what your secret sauce is. Know what you're defending. Uh, it'll really slice the problem down. I'm like, oh my gosh, they took over something about which I don't care. Like, maybe don't spend so much. Oh my gosh, if this happens, we're gone. We're out of business. That's an extinction level event. Like, if you can slice those out, you know, it's all about whittling the problem down, right? And that'll help you know where to be looking, what you need to be aggressive. Um, a couple of notes to add to this. Uh, what we did, and I mentioned that, that Chris and I have a bit of a shared history. We've kind of come together and, and, and gone, gone apart uh, at different organizations in, in a couple of different capacities. Um, I put out a couple of uh, a stack of little baseball cards, little threat baseball cards that we did at Microsoft. Those actually were the shiny, silly front end to a threat pattern database that we created and a way to communicate to the rest of the, uh, the, the analysis and response staff um, at Microsoft and partners at Amazon and Google, where we could actually get them, because they picked it up and went, oh, shiny. Then they turned it over and they started using the language we were putting in their mouths, and so they started to describe attacks in a, more, in a better way that we actually could map back to our controls. That was a, that was a neat way for us. We had a little bit of budget to do that. That, that proved terribly effective. Um, the attack patterns, being able to go through uh, the you know, last five years' worth of history and saying, look, we've been hit with these things that weren't hygiene events. Interesting stuff. Let's break it down, see what it is. Hey, look, the number of attack activities is pretty limited, pretty small. Folks swap tools all the time. They do not swap methods all the time. And we're able to break it down and say, oh, well, all right, we have... 70% coverage for everything that's been done to us in the past few years. Informing people, showing, you know, basically sharing that knowledge, finding a simple way that doesn't like, you know, cause people to, oh, maybe you want me to go through a thousand, you know, a thousand event database. You know, finding some simple way to categorize and map it back to controls is hugely, hugely uh, effective. And to Chris's point, detection, you kind of inventory, knowing what you have, and mapping it back is, is essential. Communication? Yeah, I mean, if you control all of your own budget, rad. Good on you. Uh, most of us don't, right? Most of us have to go to our executives and say, look, I know we've spent this much. We've spent this much of it really well. We've maybe not spent that much uh, as well. Here's how we're going to squeeze the most attention out. Like, we but, do this for a living, right? This is business. So if you can communicate to them in a way that's sane, that's not rational, that's not like, oh my gosh, let's freak out. Yeah, coming back and being able to say, look, something bad happened to us on entry here. <laughs> However, our blind, but we we saw it, we handled it. It's it's done. Uh, please don't reshuffle my budget and make me go buy tools that I don't need, because you know I, I haven't been in an organization where we don't have things that are sitting on a shelf. Where yeah, they bought us for us. They bought this for us. We have four of these overlapping tools. We don't use them. Versus the areas being able to do this in a succinct way with a structured argument that says, look, here's what we got, here's what we need. There are the gaps between the curvy line and the, and, and the what we have to detect. Um, much more effective to be able to drive out those blind spots and to, uh, and to even out your detection. Yeah, it, the metaphor, right, is like if you have a fire suppression system, if you're super paranoid, have two, right, in case one breaks. You probably don't need six. You've already got two, and your exact like, well, I've just got this brand new fire suppression system. Is it better to get rid of the old one? No? Okay, let's go spend our money. Sounds good. Questions, thoughts, comments, criticisms? Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, you were saying earlier about, you know, it's no good to just close the door and really get to work out what the effects are, what you need to work out, what else has happened, what done match with whatever. How do you know when you're done? How do you build the confidence that Okay. One of the ways that we thought about this, and it is sort of in the context of automating this, was to be to, to map out um, the sort of the common attacks. Um, to, to give an example, um, and this was this was a little bit after Chris went to Amazon. Uh, we took the previous several years worth of incidents at Microsoft, um, everything that was not a sort of trivial event. Um, and, and mapped out what was every action that the adversary took. We filtered out what the analyst did to find it, 
little natural language exercise there where you go, you know, if the, if the, if the subject, verb, and predicate, if the subject isn't the adversary, then filter it out. Hang on to it, but filter it out. And then kind of normalize everything they did. And the surprising thing was pretty much every single attack over half, you know, half a decade, they only did about 40 things. Adversaries only did for about 40. They used tons of different tools to accomplish them, but the actual attack activities, uh, uh, you know, we were able to kind of categorize it. Then it leads to, you know, it's a couple of steps. It's a couple, a couple of logical steps to answer your question. But once you have an idea of sort of this normalized buckets of what's happening to you and being able to describe the, the you know, there, there are only four or five different kinds of, of uh, sort of enabling lateral movement that, are, that occur, for example. What do I need to be able to query those if the thing that happened before it only gives me IP, host name, an account, and so on? If I kind of drive out the uh, uh, you know what I could query for, be sort of logically adjacent before and after after that observed activity, I've used up the investigative usefulness of the thing I have. Go ahead and remediate. Just don't don't step on it before you actually ask the questions for what might come after. Other other thoughts, questions? Is it really possible to identify actions without getting fixated on tools or techniques? Because I think conceptually actions make sense, but then identifying lateral movement is not true, right? That's 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 a hard thing to do. Is there a practical approach to identifying actions irrespective of what tools or uh, what techniques are used? It, it's, it, in practice, it's always a mix. I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of pre-labeling. Like, everything, everything that comes out of my AV, every alert there is going to be effectively labeled as, uh, uh, you know, host compromise, and I'm going to stick it in one, one kind of course category. Um, there are going to be a lot of, of uh, activities that you see on a network where... I'm not sure what's going on here. This is authorized. This is authorized behavior. I need to actually spend some time um, uh, looking for certain behaviors over time. So if you're doing string-based detection, it's very hard to find those, and you might have to do correlation over time, where uh, I can find a past the hash attack based on a sequence of connections and different usernames over a period of a few minutes or a few hours. Um, that I couldn't see if I'm just doing a snapshot and those activities, it's only practical to develop the detections for those activities by looking at a bit of a threat history and seeing what have I been hit with. Because I can't go defining rules in a typical organization for every possible action that an adversary could take. But I can write rules for the hundred things that are being that, that we've seen that have actually happened to a to a functional organization. The other thing to call it there is the separation of tools from action is true on both sides, right? Malware is a tool, it is not a thing. It, it is a thing that a person is using to do something. The person ultimately is the threat. It's the person who's going to do something bad. In the same way you're using your detection tools to figure out what they're doing. The detection is a way of mapping them. It's not the same as them. So the ability to string these capabilities together, whatever the tools are. Uh, I hear alert logic makes some pretty good ones, by the way. But string them together, you know, understand what you're seeing out of that, understand what you're seeing out of your own capabilities. Look at your just basic use, uh, usage data. You know, we used to say, uh, try to rob a bank without using the floor of the bank, right? Try to rob a network without using the network. And then the question becomes, well, what are they doing different than all your users? If you're doing something bad, by definition, you are doing something different. So what are your anomalies? And you can string all that together. You can actually really quickly... And easier than you might think, put together a pretty decent picture of the problems you're under, the threats you're under, and the attacks you're suffering. So, any other questions? If you think of something afterwards, please feel free to bring us uh, John at Alert Logic, CRC at Alert Logic. This is what we do all day, every day. This is our thing. I, well, I'm happy to bore you over dinner about these sorts of things. I, it's all I talk. So, like, if you want to talk more, please do this. Great. Thank you very much.